John was a very hard taskmaster. He, uh, as I say, had this vision and he never wanted to hear, John, you can't do that. He said, yes, you can. He said, just find a way of doing it. So, uh, <laughs> everyone. Um, my great pleasure this morning to be t talking to Dr. Denise Whitehouse, the John Truscott Fellow uh, Research for 2019. Uh, and in this particular uh, segment, we're going to be talking about Bob Minikin uh, and daytime and nighttime aspects uh, of the expo because when I interviewed Bob Minikin now some time ago, um, it was one of the key points that he made that oh, yeah, was that it was really two expos. It was a daytime expo and a night expo. And that is unusual because generally expos have been held in the summer in areas that would so say you've got not really a nighttime expo. Um, and Brisbane was, was a unique in that extent. And this is significant and a very defined daytime expo and nighttime expo. And I think John Trott's got genius really come to the fore as Denise just was explaining it to us about uh, Times Square, which is a fascinating story that I hadn't heard before. I'm just so happy that you explained that to me. Um, and so just coming back, I think you've interviewed uh, Bob Minikin, and I'm sure he would have said how, what a joy it was to handle two artistic geniuses in the form of Rick Birch, who I know you've also interviewed, um, and, um, you know, John Truscott. Uh, and, you know, you made comment before about John's ability to create a team. Well, he obviously also must have had an incredible ability to step into a work in progress and pick up the threads of the thoughts uh, of what was in place and then make them blossom. Um, because he came to the Expo narrative quite late in the piece, considering that it was a fully fledged organisation from 1983 and he lands on the doorstep of Expo in 1987. Um, so, uh, Bob Medigan and uh, Nighttime Daytime Expo. Um, so we can continue on your thoughts about all of that, uh, Denise. Uh, now, John came to Expo probably April 1987. So that gives you a sense of the very short time span he had to achieve what he did achieve. And that is characteristic of John is that he worked intensely when he was on a project, you know, type of, again, with little sleep. And he built teams around him. Now, he brought a team from Melbourne up with him that have worked on the Arts Centre. Um, and they, they were um, a design team, a design studio team that did the... Um, did the design, worked with Cato and did the graphic design for the flags and the banners the, uh, that were in the place, things like, like that. Um, so, and now, um, John's, John had the ability to come in and um, quickly grasp what was um, the core of the issue, which is what he did in the Art Centre as well. Um, he came, you know, he came in with preconceived ideas, probably. He would have thought very carefully. I understand that he worked through all the submissions that the public had given about what they would like to see at the expo. He had worked thoroughly through all the plans very, very early in the piece. So he had that. So he... Um, had also, I think, good experience at coming in and sorting out other people's problems, which is really what he did with Camelot and with um, the Art Centre as well. So he had a, he was a very hands-on person. He did things hands-on himself. He could turn something, you know, a bit of nothing into something. That was his innate ability. But he also had a presence and Bob Minikin talks about this, this incredible presence that he had and persuasiveness that he could draw you into his vision very persuasively and make you go with it. 
Um, and as you know, there are the stories of John being able to persuade Queensland's um, treasurer to, to allow, you know, to, to give money that nobody had ever seen anybody be able to do before. He, nobody else could get money out of him, but John... Actually, the under-treasurer, Sir Leo Hilton. Under-treasurer, thank you, yes. Sir so Leo is one yeah. of the hardest-nosed, highly intelligent uh, public servants with longevity like no one, I don't think, in Australia's history. But then he puts Australian, young Australian sculptures, he gives them commissions. Um, there were 16 commissions, for, um, but not all of those were Australian, but there's 16 commissions for young artists. And that's very John, because he was given such opportunities when he was young and he believed in building our culture. And then his love of robotics. Um, true. So, he the robotics there. What we might do there, uh, Denise, is again break off. So we've got, I think, Bob Minikin well covered within all of that uh, as a separate topic. Um, and yes, we, we'll come back in a minute, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and we'll be talking about uh, Ken Wellen and robotics and art busters because they all tie up together. So uh, thank you for watching and uh, we'll be back in a minute. John was a very hard taskmaster. He uh, 